So I am just about to make a recipe for a potluck I was invited to. My family has a tradition of making something that we've always called goobar, which means old man or kind of like old fogey, but in Swedish. And we think that this recipe that's just been handed down is probably a take on the um, the lusabula or the lusakatha bread. So let's get started. I have here, I have a bunch of things on this plate. I've got um, saffron, which is, this is a saffron and cardamom flavored bread. So we have saffron, a little bit of salt, about a half a teaspoon, um, a packet of yeast or about two and a quarter teaspoons if you're going to measure it out. I've measured mine out, it's not in a packet. And I have about two tablespoons of cardamom. Uh, then I'm going to use about, well, I'm gonna use 12 ounces because it comes in this, but you could use like one cup, uh, a cup and a half, I think 12 ounces is about a cup and a third. So I'm using about a cup and a third of milk. I'm going to use um, about a half cup of sour cream um, this is a three quarters cup of sugar, an egg beaten separately, and uh, about a quarter cup of butter. Tomorrow you will actually need, tomorrow, I say tomorrow because I'm going to let it sit overnight. Tomorrow you're going to need another egg uh, to beaten and then so that you can brush it on the top of the breads and you will also need currants or raisins. Of course, if you get raisins, you're gonna have to cut them up into little pieces and you'll see why. So what comes first is we're gonna put the milk in, um, in a pan that you can put on the stove and we are going to mix in the saffron. Once your milk is warm, then you can stir in the yeast then go ahead and blend in the sugar. Once the sugar is melted in, then you can put in your butter. Let the majority of the butter melt. There can be chunks, that's fine. Um, and remember, don't uh, don't let it boil or you know get too hot. So you want to keep a low temperature on the flame. All right, once it's been uh, heated up a little bit and you've got the majority of the mixture uh, mixed together, again, don't worry about little chunks of butter here and there. Um, also, the yeast might clump up a little bit. But once you got that, then you can turn the heat off and uh, just let that cool down. For a little bit. So when your mixture is cooled down enough, or just cooled down a little bit, um, then you can put in your sour cream, which will help it cool down a little bit more. And then we'll put in the egg. You definitely don't want to put the egg in if it's too hot because it'll actually cook the egg. Like, uh, like those egg drop soups. If it's too hot, it'll actually cook the egg immediately as you pour it in. So we'll cool it down a little bit even more with the sour cream. Then once you've got the sour cream mixed in and it's uh, cool enough, you can put in your egg that you've beaten in a, in a separate dish. And mix that up. And go ahead and let that sit for just a second. So while that's sitting, you can get a, a bitter bowl, uh, a dry one that you haven't used yet, and uh, you can put about two cups of flour in. You will ultimately be using about, uh, let's say, six, maybe even eight. That might get a little dry though. So maybe six or seven cups. So you start with two, um, put two in there. You can kind of make a little dent in the flour and then pour your material into the little dent and start mixing it. 
So as you're pouring it in, you can kind of be uh, beginning to mix the flour with the liquid. So once that mixture, um, once you get the liquid mixed in with the, the dry flour, you're going to want to keep adding a little bit more flour. So keep track roughly of how much you're putting in, um, but you can also tell just kind of by judging and looking at it. But So I put about two, a little more than two cups in, so I'm going to put, um, start adding about two more cups in. Mixing that, and I haven't even put all my liquid in, so I'm going to put a little more liquid in. It can be a, a slow process, but um, it kind of helps it get a little bit more mixed up and more of the same consistency throughout. So if you're going to be if you're going to be taking this to a potluck like I am, or making it for anybody else, uh, please be sure to wash your hands before kneading the dough. Even if you think your hands are dirty and it's just for you, I'd still recommend washing your hands. Alright, so I'm going to take the dough off of the spoon as much as possible. And then I'm going to kind of powder my hands to get them less, less sticky and then just dig in and keep adding a little bit of flour at a time eventually the dough is going to get thick enough and stable enough to uh, be able to be uh, kneaded and uh, pushed around without sticking to the edges and without sticking to your hands and around that time that's when you know um, that it's just about done so at this stage, add the flour in really small amounts because just very quickly you can add too much. So be really careful about adding flour. My dough is getting to a really nice kneading cons consistency. So at this point, I'm going to take it out of the bowl and then knead it on a flat surface to um, be able to mix it up a little bit better. I'm just going to put a little bit of flour on the bottom so it doesn't stick. I like to keep adding flour to my hands so it keeps it from like sticking in between the fingers and it just kind of feels a little gross and just messy. And then um, if you do need flour, add it in really small quantities now, even just, you know, kind of um, sprinkle it on or sprinkle it on the surface where you're kneading it because you really don't want to get too much. Just add little by little. If you find some pieces are kind of sticking, like if you push in hard enough and um, some sticky parts come out, it means you're not quite done. So just keep adding flour a little bit by a little and uh, keep kneading a little longer. This was always my favorite part when I was little. I thought the kneading the dough was so cool for some reason. <laughs> This is like the, the part that takes the longest and it's the hardest work for sure. It's also kind of the, um, I don't know if you'd call it stressful, that might be too strong of a word, but it's kind of the most stressful because you don't want to um, add too much flour. I've been, I've been kneading my bread for about 10 minutes now. I've worked myself up into a sweat 
and uh, I'm ready to I think it's just about done it's it's sticky if I grab it but it doesn't stick to me so that's about right so now I'm gonna set it in a, a clean dry bowl and uh, let it sit overnight and while it's hanging out in the bowl uh, it's going to possibly double in size so um, I'm not sure my bowl is big enough but for the meantime I'm gonna put a wet towel over the top and probably before I go to bed if it's if the towels like sticking into the dough which it is already <laughs> I might just leave the towel off um, and find another lid so or I could put it on a maybe I'll put it on a plate well I'm gonna leave it in this for now so I'm gonna let it sit I'm gonna let it sit for as long as possible Okay, not quite. I'm gonna let it sit between 12 and 16 hours. So you might be wondering why I wanna let my bread sit for 12 to 16 hours when you really might only need to let it sit for two to four. Well, I, I recently learned, I'm really excited about it, um, about the, the benefits of fermented wheat products uh, and how it's better for uh, digestion as well as it creates a more natural flavor that has been called umami by some cultures um, anyway I, I came across this book really by chance just on Facebook through a post and, um, and I love it it's totally changed the way I think about bread and people with gluten problems might not have gluten problems with fermented wheat products so um, anyway, whenever I make bread or anything like that, cookies, pancakes at home, I let the I let it sit for a really long time to let the wheat ferment and uh, break down from the enzymes that naturally occur over um, about that amount of time. So anyway, if you're interested in the book, um, I'll I'll put the the guy's Facebook page on there, um, and you can find it that way, or maybe get more information if you're interested. Alrighty, good morning. So my bread sat overnight, probably about 14 hours, and it's ready to be uh, punched down and molded into the goo bar shape, and then sat for a little bit. So I was preparing this morning, getting ready, and I had a big realization that this is my biggest oven pan. <laughs> um, I can make cookies in this, or I can you know make uh, baked dishes in this, but I can't make 16 or 18 goobar. It's <laughs> just going to take forever. Um, so I've called the hostess of today's potluck and I asked her if I can go over there. She said I can come over there and cook early. And so I will be finishing the video over there. Um, and uh, my bread is already falling. That's fine. It's probably going to have fallen more by the time I get over there. But um, that's okay. We'll go from there. <laughs> So I'm all set up here in my friend's apartment and I'm ready to uh, punch the dough down and start rolling it out. I'm going to put a little bit of flour on the surface so that it doesn't stick. Also, just a little bit on my hands. Because the top dried a little bit, I'm going to um, just do a little bit more kneading to try to mix in the dry parts with the wetter parts. All right, so I think I got my dough pretty well mixed now, and now I'm ready to actually make the shapes of the goo bar. So I'll just start taking off little chunks. So this is a good size for a head. It's kind of like an inch and a quarter. You just make a little ball out of that. So you need the the head, the arms, and the legs. 
So the arms and the legs need to be a little bit bigger. So this one's a little bit bigger. So I'm going to roll it out. And on your grease baking sheet, you can, you can put the head. And then this one's a little bit big, so I'm going to make this one the legs. And then you just wrap the legs like that. And then the arms connect the legs and the head. All right, so I just got all of the goo bar made, at least for this batch, because this is all I can fit in the oven right now. And after that, the next step is to take these little currants. They're pretty much the same thing as raisins, but um, they're smaller. So you take currants, and then you put, give them little eyes and uh, a nose, and uh, three buttons is what we've always done. I'm just going to push them in there a little bit so they get stuck in the dough. And then, uh, once those are in, you can take just a little bit of uh, whipped egg and kind of put it all over the top of the pastry. So I just finished glazing up these guys. This is going to be the first batch and I got all the currants in. So now I'm just going to let them sit for one to two hours to rise a second time and get a little more plump and um, the, it'll also help the legs and the arms and the head kind of congeal together. So I got the first batch pretty much ready. It sat for about an hour and they're looking really nice and plump. So I'm going to put them in the oven now. They'll go in the oven for about 15, 12 to 15 minutes on at 250 degrees. All right, here they are and they are done. Voila, here are the goobers of the Peterson family tradition. So now the festivities can begin.